Good afternoon, everyone. As Patricia said, I'm Sherry Ely, and I am the Program Director for Juvenile Justice at the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. Welcome to today's webinar. In October of 2018, the National Council entered into a partnership with the Animal Legal Defense Fund to address judicial response in court cases that are related to animal cruelty. This was the first type of formal partnership between a judicial organization and an animal protection organization. In July of 2019, the National Council approved a resolution regarding animal cruelty and its links to other forms of violence. Also, that same month in July of 2019, the National Council released a technical assistance bulletin that is for judges on animal cruelty issues. Both the resolution and the bulletin will be referenced during the webinar today, and links to both are included at the end of the webinar. Today's webinar allows us to take a deeper dive to examine the link between animal cruelty and child abuse. The presentation over to Judge Romero. Welcome, everyone. It's a, an honor and a pleasure to be part of this webinar today. Um, and you may be wondering what pictures of, of felines are on this slide. Uh, a, a little bit of, of, of about me, if you'll indulge me. Uh, I'm a grandfather. Uh, I'm a great-grandfather. And uh, my wife and I have been blessed with two uh, children who are in their 40s uh, as we speak. So to call them children is not unusual. What that has to do with, with, uh, with these two critters is that uh, they are our surrogate family now. They are part of our family. Uh, we uh, adopted them from Animal Humane, and we were told that they were sisters, and I certainly believe they are. They hang around together. They're, uh, uh, they're good buddies, uh, and they're partners in crime. However, just like with the two children that were born into our family and with our grand grandkids, even though they are siblings, they're as different uh, in many respects as our own kids are. Uh, Luna, who you can tell on the left-hand side, who you can tell maybe just from looking at her picture, she's um, very genteel. She's a lady in every respect. Um, she rarely ever gets in trouble that we see her getting in trouble, although I'm sure she shares in Ruby's misdeeds. Uh, Ruby uh, is exactly the opposite. She is very much like Tigger, uh, if any of you know Tigger. She bounces around all over the place as an instigator. And um, uh, the wild look in her eyes is very much who she's like. She's, she's playful. Uh, she's um, uh, always into something and is underfoot much of the time. Um, so I say that just to address the, the first question, do you have a pet? And we have these two, and they're uh, the ones that we have left after several other animals that we've had, including dogs in our past when our children lived at home. Um, so many of you have a pet. Um, and then, as you've already gathered from my description of Luna and Ruby, uh, they're very much our family members. Uh, even though they're uh, pests sometimes and their demands for attention or not wanting to give us attention, they do very much dictate uh, the routine every day uh, in our household. Um, so what does that have to do with child abuse and neglect? And the question, can animals play a role in child welfare? And we'll be addressing that throughout the webinar today. After this webinar, you're going to have a greater understanding of the link between animal, cru animal cruelty and child abuse. Many of you already are aware of those things. Some of you maybe not. Uh, you know, what do animals have to do with children who are in out-of-home care? Um, we're going to learn a lot about the history and the significance of the link between animal cruelty and all forms of, of violence, including uh, child abuse and child neglect. We're going to talk about uh, what we judges can do on and off the bench to safeguard family members and their pets. Uh, I would certainly invite you to uh, take advantage of the resources that have been listed uh, in the web links, the resolution to, on animal cruelty, while it is a call out to judges from a judge's organization. I think all of us can benefit from reading that um, over and over. And finally, the end notes that support the resolution uh, are very helpful as far as research that went into the resolution and additional information that may be valuable to you. 
I'll talk a little bit more about the enhanced resource guidelines from the National Council as we move on with the webinar. If any of you spend any time at all watching TV, and some of us a lot more now than we used to, we see a lot of commercials about pet food and toys and all of that stuff for dogs, cats, and assorted other critters. Uh, and that's not accidental. Uh, marketing recognizes that 68% of U.S. families have a pet or more in their household. This is Diane. We are going to take turns on this particular slide, and I would note that there are millions and millions of owned dogs and owned cats, and these statistics are kept by the pet food industry, and they also have statistics about how many people, for example, throw birthday parties for their pets, but it's a huge industry. Uh, what's really significant as we move through this presentation is for you to understand that the child in the United States is more likely to grow up with a pet than with a stay-at-home father. This is such a stunning um, uh, piece of information and it just shows the magnitude of the importance of a pet in a child's life as well as the entire family. And the point that Diane just made uh, can be unpacked at various levels having to do with some of the things that are front and center in our social justice arena nowadays, but that's not what this webinar is about, a uh, discussion for a future webinar. Um, and as you've already heard me talk about you know, Ruby and Luna, 99% of pet owners consider their animals to be not just companions, but maybe also members of the entire family unit. Uh, pet owners definitely report higher self-esteem, less fearfulness, less loneliness, more extroversion, and more exercise than non-pet owners. This is particularly important for us to also recognize in the area of elders and how much fulfillment an elder as well as a child gets from having a pet in the family. Children talk to their pets and their pets help them feel less lonely and more accepted. I will talk about this a little bit later when we talk a bit about the human-animal bond. Sometimes pets talk back to their owners, either in the voice of another owner or through their own expression. So uh, they do think and they do manipulate just like our own kids do. Um, many kids that are in our system refer to their pets as their uh, they're companions who have unconditional love for them. Uh, they even rank them above their parents, uh, and I might mention that a little bit later in one of the cases that I have. Um, even some of their friends, uh, quote unquote friends, we all know that young people have friends, but they're not really what we would call friends, particularly if we're their parents. But many of the kids tell us that, you know, they're most likely to have this relationship with their pets uh, into the future, no matter whether they've gotten angry at each other, uh, whatever their relationship has been, uh, they have an unconditional loving relationship with one each other. We'll talk more about the link uh, between child abuse uh, and neglect and animal cruelty, and we're going to begin to do that now. So. Um, a number of things that research has shown that if um, a juvenile abuses an animal, that we should not just look at that for what it may seem to be, but it may be a red flag flapping in the breeze that says that juvenile, that child himself or herself, has been or continues to experience abuse in their uh, household, in their caregiver's home. Um, we know that in child welfare, much of what we do in our current system, hopefully will change when uh, the uh, families first is fully implemented, uh, but children, uh, as we learn about the cases that we do, have witnessed anim animal abuse in their own household. The things that we do as uh, a system of child abuse and neglect is traumatizing enough to children, separating them from family, from their siblings, and yes, even from their pets, um, particularly when they've witnessed their pet being abused by an adult caregiver, their need to protect that, that pet uh, is increased many fold when we take them out of that household. Uh, foster care placement um, is a very tough thing for kids. It's hard for any of us to imagine 
Some of us have experienced it, but hard to imagine what it means to be removed from the only thing that you know and placed with strangers, where there may be other kids that you compete with, um, who, uh, with adults who don't know you, who don't look like you, and in some instances don't speak the same language and have different cultural values. Add to that being separated from your buddy, the person that you speak to that maybe speaks back to you and your understanding and who needs your protection and care and is no longer and you're no longer available to provide that that care. Much of the research research suggests that in homes with um, uh, interpersonal violence going on that that pet for a child is actually a protective factor for those children and they have someone that they can cuddle with, they can hide in the closet with whenever things are going south in the home, um, and that they, you know, value highly. But that has a, a downside to it. Uh, we know from years and years of uh, work in domestic violence, and certainly it's all interconnected and inseparable from, from child abuse, that uh, perpetrators very often use anim animals to keep control over those that they want to manipulate and keep secret from the rest of uh, the, house, the, the community outside their household. We know that children very often will jump in to uh, protect mom from an abusive father or vice versa. Uh, children will do the same to protect their companion animal if they are being harmed by those in the household uh, who are mistreating uh, the, the pets. An important thing uh, to remember with this uh, slide and a takeaway is that animal cruelty um, is not happening in a vacuum. It, it is a red flag indeed that says others in the home may not be safe, including children in the home. For those of us who are judicial officers, for those of you who are attorneys, social workers, or other uh, folks who are regularly in court, back in the old days when we actually used to be in court, not by video, but many of you still appear for these hearings uh, via video if you're not physically present in the courtroom. Um, so a couple things to, to contemplate on for those of us who appear in court, um, are there pets in the household? Uh, do, does a child or do the children have an attachment to the pet? And on and on, you can read the bullet points um, and I would suggest to you that uh, unless all of us involved in the child welfare system ask questions, we don't necessarily know the answers to these questions, particularly when our focus is on the child, the parents, and all of the um, implicit and explicit biases we bring to the table when we're in court. So the preliminary protective uh, custody hearing, the shelter hearing, uh, whatever it's called in your jurisdiction, is very often the first contact that, that uh, we in the courtroom will have um, an ability to ask more questions. Some of us, uh, like in my jurisdiction, we get uh, an affidavit uh, in support of an ex parte custody order that legally places the child at least temporarily in the in an out-of-home placement. And very often in those things, some of the things very familiar to us, you know, the home was a mess, there was dog feces on the floor, there were uh, pet dishes with scant food, there, were no, there was no food in the cupboard for adults. But do we ever ask about, uh, are the pets being mistreated as well? These are questions that need to be asked, not just glossed over as we read the initial reporters, we conduct the first hearing when in the olden days it used to be a five-minute hearing. I would suggest to you that it's impossible to do a meaningful custody shelter hearing in that period of time. The enhanced resource guidelines, which are included on the last slide uh, as a very valuable resource from the National Council, uh, reminds us of the harm we cause when we remove children from, from their home of origin. Not only are we separating them from parents, siblings, from school, from their neighborhood uh, friends, but as we've heard already, sometimes from those that they value more than any of those, their pets. So when we make a decision to remove a child from the home or to continue the, the child in an out-of-home placement, 
let's not forget to ask about those other very important, um, I hate to hesitate to say individuals, although they are, they're, they're family members, they're pets, they're friends to these children. So what can we do to safeguard family members and the pets that they are attached to? Well, think about it a little bit. As uh, those of us who practice in court, um, whether we're judges or otherwise, um, I think it's important for us to recognize that unless we ask questions and know what resources are available in our community, and I would suggest to you respectfully that we don't learn those things as judges, as judicial officers from hanging around in chambers or in the courtroom. We need to partner with those organizations in the community to find out these things that are very important. So Diane is going to talk a little bit about more about the link between animal abuse and child abuse. But before she gets to that, I want to suggest to you that um, when a child is removed from their home and you're the presiding officer or you're the, you're the uh, attorney for the, for the child protection agency or an attorney representing children or parents, uh, ask those questions of them about animals in the home and what relationship there is to the child that is being removed. Uh, if there are services that need to be put in place, uh, you can't know what those services are unless you engage in your community and you know that you can order those things and have them be uh, related to the harm that is uh, reported being done uh, within that household, including the harm that is being done to pets. Diane? Thank you. Thank you, Judge Romero. It is a pleasure to be here and welcome to everyone. This is a wonderfully emerging area that the National Council has embraced and we are ever so thankful for that. I'm going to take some time now to talk to you about the link between animal abuse and child abuse. Uh, and here's a picture of my dog, Maverick, who has a huge link to his stuffed husky. Um, what's inescapable and what you really need to understand about the link is that when animals are abused, people are at risk, and when people are abused, animals are at risk. So if we just substitute the word child for people, it's clear that when animals are abused, children are at risk. When children are abused, animals are at risk. So it's very important for the judiciary to embrace this concept and recognize that when you have a child appearing before you, um, either in a dependency or a delinquency uh, um, hearing to recognize the significance a pet must play in their life. I see the link primarily as threefold. Number one, it's the link between cruelty to animals and violence towards humans. There is an inextricable link among all of these types of events, whether it's an act of commission or an act of omission. There is a link, for example, between neglect of children and neglect of animals, as well as abuse of animals and abuse of children. And one topic we um, need to address is the issue of bestiality, which has um, historically been uh, a formid forbidden topic to discuss, but we really have to recognize that also there may be indicators that if an animal is being sexually abused, a child may be sexually abused, and the reverse is true. If a child's being sexually abused, an animal may be sexually abused, and we need to pay particular attention to these offenders and intervene as early as possible for uh, evaluation and treatment. There's also... Diane, the may I uh, interject something real quick? Absolutely. Uh, this is a great reminder for me because we're seeing... A horse, and that's a huge animal. Um, and most of us in urban America would not have a horse in our household. Maybe some of us would. But large animals are victims of animal abuse just like little kittens and puppies and rabbits are. In my own community, um, a couple of weeks ago, there was uh, uh, in the media, to the extent we believe the media, but several people whose horses were found slaughtered and butchered in, 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 in the corral, and I apologize for being so, so gross about it. Uh, in another uh, rural part of our community, uh, a beloved horse was shot by a drive-by in a drive-by shooting, inexplicably for no reason. What motivates this kind of stuff? 
who knows, but don't, uh, don't lose sight of the fact that large animals are subject to cruelty from humans as well. Thank you, I'm Diane. So, yeah, I'm so glad Judge Romero brought that up. And it is important to note that in many households, the horse is a pet, is a family member, is a companion. And we've seen this time and time again in situations involving domestic violence on every level and animal cruelty. So it also segues perfectly to my next point about the link between a human and an animal, which we uh, don't have time to talk about today, the human-animal bond, but we will just touch on it the significance and the strength of that bond and how important it is for us to recognize that in dealing with children that come into the context of a courtroom. And lastly, there's a link among all the agencies and individuals concerned about the safety of the community uh, and the, the successful progress of a community. I can tell you that back in the early 1900s, I'm in Colorado, there was an actual statute on the books that mandated humane education as part of the elementary school curriculum. So it would be also very important for us to connect and collaborate with educators and church members and animal control and psychologists and psychiatrists and police and social workers. I mean, the, the list is endless. If we want to make a dent in curbing violence in its many forms, we need to collaborate uh, and educate one another. I always stress in a presentation that awareness of the link is a matter of public safety and human welfare. This particularly rings true when I speak with law enforcement because it's important for them to notice that if we want to approach violence and get to the root of it, we need to be aware of this link. And I think Judge Romero wanted to make some comments as well. I think it's difficult in this day and age of COVID and uh, social unrest and social awareness uh, to not also interject that public safety and public welfare and public health uh, are inextricably intertwined. Um, and of concern in the child welfare arena is that children who used to spend roughly five days a week in school with teachers and friends and uh, maintenance people and uh, social workers and, and nurses who very often were the first line of, of, of sounding the alarm that we believe this child is being abused uh, or mistreated at home, that that, link, that, that connection is missing nowadays. Uh, school is uh, starting in some places and other places it's going to be via video, but an awareness that in the age of COVID, the issue of uh, public safety, public health, and community safety as it relates to our children is impacted by the lack of contact or the minimized contact between those in the community who used to be the first line mandatory reporters and now uh, that connection is, is, is reduced significantly. Thank you, Diane. Um, yes, it's really important to recognize how much um, violence plays in terms of a threat to public health. And it's increasingly been made aware by the Center for Disease Control, which years ago they recognized domestic violence as a threat to uh, public health. So it's really important for us to embrace this link on multiple levels. The significance of recognizing this link is twofold. Uh, number one is crime prevention. If we intervene really early with a child that is demonstrating some tendencies towards uh, abuse or neglect of an animal, we do want to get at the root of it because uh, obviously we can't attribute their actions to uh, one particular event or events that have happened in their life. There's always been um, some contribution of nature and nurture uh, that evolve. But if we recognize that a child is being abusive or neglectful for an animal, we need to intervene early and give that child the treatment, the evaluation and treatment that he or she needs to hopefully prevent it from uh, transitioning into forms of violence against animals, property, or other humans. Without regard to the nature of the violence, it's important to intervene early, and we might just uh, 
make a dent in crime prevention. Uh, when we talk to law enforcement, we stress that when they come across a case where a child or juvenile or even an adult has abused an animal, that the days of saying it's just a dog or just a cat, that those days are over and they need to take these crimes seriously if they want to deal with crime in their precinct or county or community. It also um, um, it makes it, uh, let's say, better for us to embrace and break the cycle of family violence. As Judge Romero alluded to earlier, these cases are interwoven inextricably. We rarely see child abuse standing alone or animal cruelty or elder abuse or domestic violence. And quite frankly, the fifth circle I see is just criminal conduct. There's often something interwoven, and we have multiple agencies responding to one address. We might have child welfare responding, the police responding, and animal control responding, because there may be an overall atmosphere of violence and neglect in that household. And that's another reason why we need to collaborate and educate to break the cycle of family violence. Uh, one of my favorite quotes in this regard is from Mary Lerandauer, who is uh, very experienced in this field. And I know next week you're going to hear from the wonderful Dr. Barbara Boat, who will, I'm sure, be addressing this as well. Is it simply put, bad people do bad things. There's no particular sequence in which they do them. We used to think that there was a graduation theory that children that were harmful to animals or killed animals would grow on to be serial killers. And we have modified that stance to understand that bad people do bad things in no particular order. But it is not surprising at all that there is a co-occurrence of violence towards animals and violence towards humans by the same individual. One of the best um, uh, kind of characterizations of recognizing this link were four woodcuts created in 1750 by William Hogarth in the United Kingdom. And I urge you, if you have time, to look at these woodcuts. There are four of them, and he uh, demonstrates in the first woodcut children being cruel to animals with just random acts of violence, uh, causing cats to fight with each other. There is a piece of uh, sexual assault to a dog, cockfighting, throwing animals off the roof, threatening to set animals on fire, and it follows the uh, fictional character of Thomas Nero. In the second woodcut, Thomas Nero has graduated from crimes against animals, and by the way, in the first one, he's the one sexually assaulting the dog. In the second one, he is beating a horse that is already down, and it displays cruelty towards larger animals, and it's moved from the schoolyard to the courtyard, and then there's pillaging in the background. In the third woodcut, Hogarth shows Thomas Nero being held by the citizens because he has just killed his pregnant girlfriend. So if you think about these are over 250 years old, but he is showing this uh, link of violence from childhood to adulthood and the connection to domestic violence. And in the final woodcut, Thomas Nero is publicly executed, uh, and then he is dissected. From these kind of uh, demonstrated uh, artists portraying animal cruelty and violence to humans came the first animal welfare agencies in the United Kingdom, the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. And Henry Berg patterned the ASPCA in 1886 after the RSPCA. What's really important about this is that the ASPCA, which was created back um, in, the 18th, in the 19th century, uh, it predates child welfare in the United States. And uh, when I was learning about the link, it was so surprising to me that animal welfare predated child welfare, and yet it's patterned also from the UK. The first child welfare was created. The American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children was founded in 1875, some nine years later by Henry Berg himself. 
a woman had heard about a child, this child, Mary Ellen Wilson, being abused in an apartment in New York City. And she, when she first saw the child, she saw, thought that the child was five years old when in fact the child turned out to be nine years old. And you can see the welts on her legs. So she was clearly being abused and neglected. And in that era, there was no one to investigate it. She was, by the way, in the custody of a foster care. She'd been taken from um, uh, 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 an orphanage to live with this foster family, and they did no background check, and the mother was the perpetrator of the harm. So Henry Bird dressed up his animal welfare agents, and... He dressed them as census takers because in that day and age, the census takers went door to door. They saw the state of the child. They rescued her and filed charges. And therein is the birth of child welfare in the United States. Once again, still making its way back to Henry Berg, the founder of the ASPCA. The median age for the onset of herding animals is six and a half years old, earlier than bullying, vandalism, and setting fires. So as judges, this is a, a sobering but important uh, subject for you to understand. And I put in a picture of a, um, Spike. This was a personal case that I handled when I was a prosecutor. Spike was a, this is the after photograph of Spike. And during this photo, he was probably 14 years old. Uh, when Spike um, became incontinent and hard of hearing and partly blind, his owner started treating him poorly. And the owner was in the midst of a divorce from his wife, and there was a history of domestic violence. As Spike began to fail, uh, he got more and more annoyed, and he did have a child with visitation, and he had his six-year-old son for his uh, birthday, the sixth birthday, and he gave his son a BB rifle, and he showed his son how to work the rifle by shooting Spike in the face with the BB rifle right in the presence of his son. And I apologize for the graphic nature, but this goes to show kind of this demonstrated connection. I also found out later that there were allegations that he was very rough with the child and wanted him to act like a man, and he bullied him. And once he harmed the dog, which we found the dog, and restored it to health, and he lived another two and a half years, and this is the after photo. So it also shows you that the, the, the uh, animal can be saved and rehabilitated, the child can be taken out of that toxic environment and can receive the therapy, evaluation, and treatment he needs because we've learned that if uh, that is extraordinarily harmful for a child to merely witness violence because the child... Um, thinks that's the norm and becomes desensitized to it. There's also some uh, demonstrated statistics of pecking order battering where one spouse, one parent beats the other parent, that parent beats the child, and the child beats the animal. So as Judge Romero mentioned, uh, sometimes children will try to interfere with the harm to their animals, or sometimes they will harm animals because that's what they have learned to do. Diane, if I may make a point with regard to Spike, and it's just a, sure. a, a quote attributable to James Baldwin, and um, a manifestation to me or a truism about um, the old saying, might I just tell us, don't do as I do, do as I say, and we know that that fails. It didn't work with me. It didn't work with my kids when I tried to do that uh, with them. But James Baldwin said something like this, children have never been very good at listening to their elders but they have never failed to imitate them. Right, right. That's a great quote. Thank you, Judge. I also uh, can't emphasize enough this undeniable link that a child demonstrating cruelty, cruelty to an animal may be an indicator that the child has been the victim of serious neglect, abuse, or sexual abuse and may lead to an increased likelihood of other violent behaviors in childhood and adulthood. Uh, this is a uh, a little painted rock in memory of Samson, a dog, and I'm sorry for this story as well, a dog who was killed by his 17-year-old who lived in the household. It was his pet dog. And he beat the dog to death with a hammer, staged the dog, put up a sign. He wanted people to find the dog. Uh, and it turned out that he was very destructive to his toys by um, 
beating them with a hammer and setting them on fire. When I asked his mother if he had a history of fire setting, she said, yes. I said, did you report him? Because we had a great juvenile fire setter intervention group in Denver. And she said, I didn't report him because, and I said, why? And she goes, um, because they were small fires. Uh, and it turned out when he was interviewed by the juvenile fire setter expert, he admitted to setting well over 100 fires. And what was really tragic about this young man is that uh, he lived across the street from a high school. He was 17 years old. He had a documented history of having been sexually assaulted by a male um, relative since the age of four, and it had transitioned into uh, auditory command hallucinations. So he really suffered and never really had the intervention and the, the knowledge that we needed. And apparently he had been abusive to the family pets for years, uh, but the, they didn't think anything of it or to bring it to the attention of any experts. So, And once again, it's the, this connection to sexual abuse. Often also animals are, um, children are sexually abused and the perpetrator threatens to harm the pet if the child uh, tells anyone that they are being the victim of sexual abuse. Protecting pets and humans. I have a couple of slides, and then I'm going to turn it back over to Judge Romero. Number one, this is a relatively new concept, and I know Dr. Boat might be addressing this as well next week, but uh, the National Link Coalition has embraced this concept of the no-hit zone, and they recognize that uh, addressing Hitting is the most prevalent risk that hitting is the most prevalent risk factor for physical child abuse. So the National Coalition uh, uh, created a poster that you can download and place in any public or other relevant place to uh, impress all citizens, all members of the public, whether professionals or not, of the importance of not hitting anyone. No one hits grown-ups or children or animals. And here's a link if you want further information. Uh, it is also important to recognize that animal cruelty often occurs in the context of domestic violence. Not always, but often. And we see a number of advertising campaigns where they morph a picture of an animal with a picture of a human. What's important here is to recognize the strength of your own state's statutes. In Colorado, we are really lucky because Within the actual statutory definition of domestic violence, we include any other crime against a person or property, including an animal, when used as a method of coercion, control, punishment, intimidation, or revenge directed against a person with whom the actor is or has been involved in an intimate relationship. This is really important because if, there, if this is included in a statutory definition, that also increases your obligations and your awareness of this problem, and at least in Colorado, it kicks in a number of other statutes. For example, in cases of domestic violence, the law enforcement has to um, investigate and collect evidence and preserve evidence. So it's really Im important to recognize what you can do in your state or what the laws are in your state. It's also uh, well within your discretion to protect pets and children via protection order or no contact orders or restraining orders, whatever you might call them in your jurisdiction, because the law, even if it's not um, specifically outlined in your statutes, you have the discretion to enter orders you deem necessary for the protection of persons and animals. In Colorado, we see it as twofold. Number one, you can do protection orders prohibiting the taking, transferring, concealing, harming, killing, molesting or disposing of or threatening to harm an animal owned, possessed, kept, or held by a victim or witness, including a minor child. We even include minor children as the protected party, therefore including their pets as protected entities. You can also specify arrangements for possession and care of an animal owned, possessed, kept, or held by any party or a minor child of any party. What's really important by these two kind of uh, opportunities you have to protect animals and children is that they are very flexible. You can call on experts to help guide you on what's the best for the children and the animals because we also want to preserve their relationship if at all possible. 
if the child is a perpetrator or the child has to go into a house with the, uh, an animal, special safeguards need to be taken for both of them. But this allows you a lot of discretion. And note also that these provisions protect pets of witnesses, not just victims, not just parties, but witnesses, including children. So this is real progress in the area of protecting children and protecting animals and recognizing their bond. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Judge Romero. Thank you, Diane. And uh, uh, Ms. Catherine Ford, to your point, and I see that Sherry responded to it in a very appropriate manner. I, I do want to comment, um, before I talk about off the bench, what we can do, I want to expand a little bit more in just a few minutes about, about more stuff that we as judges and court professionals can do in an on the bench kind of setting. But the humane education is one of the important things that can address the, the point that you raised, Ms. Ford. And uh, I don't have the actual link to the site, but it's the National Humane Education Society. And I believe if you just Google that word, it'll come up with the multiple resources that are available for humane education. And just very briefly, humane education with the society teaches all of us how to accept and fulfill our responsibilities to the animals in our, in our world and around us. Um, and not just you know the cats and dogs, but all forms of animal life. And it, it's an effort to, for lack of a better concept, to teach uh, compassion and empathy for those who have harmed other people and, other, and animals. So it is a positive approach to dealing with folks who do bad things, not folks who are bad, but uh, a, a proper frame of mind for all of us to get in, I think, that we, uh, in, our, in our court, you know, I have parents who say, my kid is a good kid, and I say, I've yet to meet a kid, that, meet a kid in our juvenile justice system that isn't a good kid, it's a kid who's done some bad things or behaved inappropriately, but they're not a bad kid. We're all salvageable regardless of our age, I would suggest, so I appreciate you bringing that up. A little bit briefly about, more briefly about what you know we can do on the bench. Uh, as judges, we have you know statutory authority, and we have also the power of being on the bench and ordering things. So, at an initial custody hearing, uh, at a dispositional hearing, the, the jurisdictional hearing, uh, and at reviews subsequent to that, we still need to be aware of what's going on with our families. We need to be the inquiring magistrate, the inquiring attorney the inquiring social worker, and to not take the questions as an affront of what we're doing, but as an effort to ensure that we know what's going on with the children and the families that come before us, to whom we owe a responsibility. Um, a teenage girl in one of my cases, it wasn't until I think the, the initial judicial review, we're already you know, a couple of months into the case, almost, uh, almost uh, three months into the case, and it wasn't until then that she basically said, I really don't care about seeing my mom and dad, but I want to see my dog. And that's kind of when the light bulb went on to me, for me, this young teenage girl has a relationship with her dog and what are we doing to uh, meet that need that she has? So at initial hearing, um, we can ask those questions. At a dispositional hearing after we gain jurisdiction over the family, we can order family time, not just between parents and the children who are removed, not just between siblings who are separated, but also with their animals. Um, in the, the domestic violence arena, I know the judges in my jurisdiction do not hesitate to issue orders of protection for the animals as well as for the, the uh, spouse, the partner who's been battered, and, and the children, but we can do that uh, even if there's no statutory provision, we can do it until we're told we can't do it. As judges and, and as attorneys, ask for that. If you don't ask, you don't get. The, uh, um, website that I made reference to, the Animal Humane uh, Society, um, that uh, that organization has a very viable program where you can get the material, you can you know work on it yourself, you can get a, a group within your court started to uh, 
to work on that as far as teaching humane treatment of animals and kindness to all people. That's one of the other things we can do. We can also order an evaluation for a child who is the subject of a child welfare arena where there are indications that, that he or she may have been um, uh, abusing animals as well. Rather than penalize or criminalize their behavior, let's try to find a way to make that uh, a, pos a positive outcome where we are changing behaviors. So off the bench, I would suggest to you there are a lot of things we can do off the bench. Uh, as judges, we can call a meeting and they will come. Uh, and even if you send an invitation to the animal control folks, uh, the shelters for um, victims of domestic violence, shelters for animals who uh, have no place to go, the uh, animal or the elder protection agencies in our community, and of course our child welfare departments. We don't have to have all of the answers. We can call the meeting and I can assure you, at least in the olden days and now with an invite from one of our uh, video uh, platforms, people are likely to join. In fact, more likely to, to join because there's some sense of arm's length relationship there. We can also require in our own court systems that we uh, engage in training, not just the judges, but in the people in our courtroom and uh, training those people who are not part of the court system but that are in our community. Um, law enforcement is an example. School professionals, um, as if they didn't have enough to do already. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, those in the classroom, those in the school setting very often are their first line of alerting us to the possibility of, of a child being mistreated. And if they know that an animal is being mistreated, we already know the link between animal maltreatment and um, human maltreatment. One of the other things that's happening nationally, in some places it's take, getting traction and in others not so much, but a move to have veterinarians be mandatory reporters. Um, while many adults are reluctant to take their child into an ER or to an urgent care center to have um, injuries treated because uh, the truth may come out that they were uh, in, uh, inflicted by human beings, uh, people are not so reluctant about taking their dogs in or their cats in. And to ask those questions uh, as veterinarians and to be part of the team that reports those potential incidences of, of abuse. And finally, even between uh, courts, in, in my jurisdiction we have four different divisions. Our children's court division is uh, a couple of miles away from the main courthouse. We have a misdemeanor court that has 24 judges in it that hear various and sundry things. And we generally communicate with each other uh, via our um, um, messaging services or by email when we have cases in common. And, and we need to encourage that and continue to train among each other uh, uh, as far as how we can be better alert to those things that are going on. So. Uh, this is the final slide. We've talked a little bit about it already. Uh, there's a little bit of time left if anyone has questions. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, Catherine Ford for your commentary, point well taken. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the floor is open. I, I don't know if Sherry may have some questions initially that she wants to draw our attention to or questions she wants to ask herself. Thank you, Judge Romero. There's one question in the chat box. Are vets mandatory reporters in any states now? And I believe Diane is responding to that question in the chat with a link to the website. And they have an yeah. interactive map that addresses yeah, I, that gonna, specific question. Sherry, I'm going to get a link to it right now, I hope. Thank you, Diane. Um, an important update I wanted to uh, draw your attention to is in the web links pod. Initially, the link for the National Link Coalition uh, was incorrect. It had a typo, but we have corrected that. And so if you want to go to that link, it should be correct now. And then there was also a question um, in the chat about whether the ALDF link fact sheet, if the link we provided was correct, and we have tested it, and it is a correct link. But if you see any other issues, please feel free to bring that to our attention or after the webinar. 
If you're having trouble downloading any of those links, just let us know and we can send you those via email as well. So Sherry, if I may add, most every state has uh, in their state bar association various sections of the law. New Mexico has an animal law uh, section that uh, any of us who are licensed attorneys can become members of that, of that section. They offer social gatherings, they offer uh, trainings and teachings, um, and, and it's one way to become aware of what's going on in your community if there's very little knowledge or very little awareness of, as to what other legal professionals may be doing. Most every state has um, a state chapter, for lack of a better term, of the National Animal Cruelty uh, Prevention Organization. And uh, in New Mexico, a very vibrant organization that does a, a lot of training. I wasn't aware of them until I joined the, uh, the animal law section of our state bar where I was introduced to them. And they conduct, in this day and age, uh, some very helpful and useful webinars uh, that originate not just in the United States, but uh, in other countries as well.